No? I guess this one. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for organizing this. No time to wait, people, especially it being 10 minutes walk from work. That's great. Uh, <laughs> best part, instead of having to travel across the world. Um, I, I won't read my title out again, having just come off an eight-hour flight. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I want to support niche formats and other hardware. Um, who am I? Um, I work on open source software. Uh, like quite a few people these days, I work in open source software, um, FFmpeg in particular, in a, both a personal and professional capacity. Um, interested in reverse engineering uh, codecs and actually hardware. So this presentation is a bit weird in that it goes in reverse chronological order, so I actually start on things I've worked on most recently. Um, it's just a bit simpler that way. Um, and although my employer is sponsoring this conference, I speak in a personal capacity in this in this presentation. Um, why FFmpeg? It's been covered a bit, but actually not in its entirety. It really is the de facto uh, mul uh, open source multimedia processing library out there, and multimedia processing library out there, really. Um, if you look at something like a web browser, where the web is actually super complicated these days, there's HTML, there's graphics, there's animation, there's video conferencing. There are actually quite a few you can choose from. There's maybe three or four. In Internet Explorer, Safari, Chrome, Firefox, etc. Very complex specifications, a wide range of different things. Um, but there isn't really anything comparable in multimedia apart from FFmpeg. It really is like the span of multimedia that's spanned is, is so vast, but there's nothing comparable. There's, there's, other, there's other applications, both commercial, uh, proprietary, and open source, that do maybe small bits of that, but there's nothing that spans that entire range. And it goes without saying, it's the basis of various video players, uh, VLC, uh, browsers, Chrome and Firefox, smart TVs, uh, even these expensive commercial applications that Peter talked about, same thing. Uh, on a technical standpoint, why is it important from a, why an archiving and preservation conference is it important? Uh, it's written in C. Um, it's not written in whatever newfangled uh, language of the week that's going to be out of fashion next year. I, I wouldn't know. I'm not really one of those fashionable people. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not one of the cool kids. Maybe someone, someone in here could tell me what this week's fashionable language is, but it's, it's not going to be in a here today, gone tomorrow language. It's written in plain C, um, and it's almost certain there'll be tens of decades, maybe even centuries of support for C. Uh, it's probably reasonable to say the way it's going. If you look at, um, you look at the way programming history is going, that's the way it is. Um, and also, it lets you play and produce media content on the device that you want to, to produce it on, be that a Raspberry Pi, be that a watch, be that a VR headset. Um, it's not locked down by a particular vendor, Apple and a few others in particular. They, they say, I have to, you can only create content on this device. Uh, so, and so some kind of sort of, um, what's the, the correct phrase, market segmentation, but it lets you use it on the device that you want to use it on. Uh, in particular, talking about reverse engineering, you really stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, there's two particular giants that need crediting, uh, Kostya Shishkov and Paul Mahal. Um, if someone could take a photo, this could be great. Because um, uh, um, these guys really mm, um, are the masters of codec reverse engineering. Um, definitely have a willingness to teach and help in their own special ways, if, if those who know them. Um, these guys have reverse engineered dozens, maybe... Maybe maybe fifty plus when you add it all up, Codex, and they've really had a monumental impact on on media playback and understanding in, in the world um, in areas you couldn't even think about. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, so why support niche formats? I appreciate I'm preaching to the converted here, but someday someone might want to discover and play these formats. Um, this has an impact now. People have formats from random devices. I need to play them. Um, need to play them long into the future as well. And to be honest, most of you in the room are this impact. Um, niche formats are also interesting. Um, multimedia is a bit strange at the moment. For the reasons I talked about, FMPEG covers so much. Multi a lot of multimedia low-hanging fruit is actually kind of done. Like, it's actually relatively, it's actually a problem we have in our communities. Actually, we're a victim of our own success. And it's actually very difficult to get into multimedia programming now because actually the multimedia programming of 10 years ago uh, or even 20 years ago, was much simpler to get started than it is now. It, to, to, get under, to get acquainted with a modern high-performance format, HEVC, AV1, really one person can't understand it all, whereas 10 years ago with H.264, 10 years before that, MPEG-2, someone could understand it all by themselves. And so trying to support niche formats is one way of getting into sort of 
understanding the concept again, or, or in, in my case, at least staying familiar with the concepts. Um, as I was saying, people are getting older, people are doing more management work and do have other things to do as opposed to spending hours on end uh, working, writing on code. So to, to, to get a familiarity with entropy coding, DCT, it's a thing you can do as relatively small projects over Easter and Christmas. Um, it's also good for new students getting them involved, um, which is a big challenge again. So most recently, it kind of started with this ticket. Hey, this is weird. Why is someone sending a MPEG-4 with 422 and 444? And I think it's 12-bit. Um, and there's still only three samples of this available. Um, uh, to this day, I've not received any real-world samples. Um, so I forgot who mentioned it, but uh, I think Jimmy mentioned it. One of the big problems is um, as um, independent developers, it's actually very expensive to buy some of these specifications. These are hundreds of dollars. Uh, it's a very common in industry, but not. Thankfully, there are, after a lot of effort, you can find these things on uh, Chinese websites. And maybe Chinese websites have done more for media pres preservation than they might have actually <laughs> thought about. But th this. Uh, yeah, this, the thing was, wow, this is different to everything I've ever seen before. 12-bit data, 444, 40, 40, 42, 444, RGB. None of this is supported in the existing code design that was probably I don't know, 15 years old by now. 16-bit coefficients, so high-quality stuff. And this really crazy uh, PCM mode, so lossless mode, where the block is scanned not as you normally think from uh, left to right, but uh, bottom to up. Uh, very strange. Only one program seemingly on Windows from Sony that was able to, to like play this, but you couldn't extract the raw data to actually compare it. So one of the nice things about working on uh, starting with, with, this wasn't really reverse engineering per se, but I'll talk about real reverse engineering later, but one of the nice things is that most codecs involve an entropy coder, and entropy coding kind of, when you implement it, it either works or it doesn't. You, you have an error or you don't, so this gets you to somewhere. You know you've actually implemented maybe, I don't know, call it, call it a third or a half of the codec already just by it not crashing or not failing. Um, the other problem with this was it had a, the, the, the transforms were much higher quality than existing, well, than existingly supported in FMPEG, so it had to port a float IDCD to do that. Basically involved, again, as I mentioned, there's no way of, ref of checking this is correct, so it involved just tweaking the picture a bit until it looked okay, and this eventually, uh, Got there, but um, so as I mentioned, because of this, the original implementation um, was kind of wrong because of the bit depth. So you can see the actual everything is off by a factor of two in the first image. So that took quite a bit of work to actually implement properly because you touch one thing in MPEG-4 and there's a whole tree of things that end up breaking. Um, I think that took another year to do that. Like just not not another years of work, but another Christmas or Easter's work just to try and figure out how to do this. It's very tedious to, ha to convert quite a complex state of um, input coefficients to intermediates to outputs. Um, and the way that's templated is very complicated. It's not ideal, but I think it is actually templated in probably the simplest way, and it's still quite complicated. Um, these crazy DPCM blocks were the next problem because uh, there was one somewhere in that image, but it was very difficult to figure out where it was. It seemed to look OK, probably in the netting or something, but. It was one, and it was like it didn't really. I didn't really know what to do about that. So after some more digging online, uh, I think possibly also on some Chinese websites, they found some uh, conformance bit streams, um, but they were in a bit of a, re a weird format. Um, so this was like the, the first one was kind of the beginning of actually trying to get this little format to work. So I think I'm right in saying all the green are DPCM blocks. I might be wrong. Um, but, and then I got to a position where I got to the bottom, but there was actually a few speckles of black uh, in places, and this was a bit. Uh, this was a bit of a headache-inducing thing. Uh, one of the interesting things about reverse engineering is, it, oddly, um, if you actually just look at the problem, many times it actually goes away. And for most of getting from that to that, that was basically it. Just looking at it and thinking about thinking about what you're trying to do actually got rid of most of it. But I got stuck. There were these blocks everywhere. There were these black blotches everywhere. What's the problem? And after some more digging, um, there's actually a, a reference implementation from 2002 that I found, and uh, I had a typo. Uh, X shift N minus is not the same as minus X shift N, basically. There are still some minor errors, very, very subtle. Again, I have no way of knowing, actually, if that's in the source. Um, I could probably try and get the reference implementation to compile, but very difficult, to, very time consuming to do that, but 
possibly to do with the intermediates not being right. Uh, the next thing I worked on was based off this press release. This was like, ooh, Cineform is one of the things in FMP that's not supported. This press release will um, let us understand what's going on. But it has a key, I don't know if I can draw on this. No, I don't think I can on this Mac. But it has a key, uh, key phrase here. If you ignore the marketing, there's a key phrase here. Core technology, right? Core technology, core technology doesn't mean the codec. It just means some marketing to say bits of the codec were used. Uh, so at work, we unfortunately subscribe to SMPT. We won't be for a lot many much longer, thankfully. But um, uh, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're all at a different conference in LA now, so don't worry about them. <laughs> uh, uh, so some things are similar, but some things were different. There were some hints, and one of the things I got quite lucky on was um, it talks about the low-pass coefficient, so the smallest rendition of the frame were raw. And luckily, this uh, sample somebody gave me had a lot of flat color, so I could literally just open it in a hex editor and see, hey, this is where the low-pass coefficient starts. So ignore all the problems with it, but the background of that phone, it was all one color, and you can see straight away, if you look in the hex editor, all of that's pretty much one color. Also got a bit lucky that um, there was one published code book um, and uh, this sample happened to use that one. Uh, there were others I found out later from the binary decoder. Um, so I probably could have reverse engineered those. And this was actually something Paul helped a lot with. Um, so you keep reverse engineering. Ask, thankfully, Cineform is quite a wide ranging sample. There are still encoders out there. So it wasn't a case of like of, of asking people um, of asking people for samples and getting none. There were, people could contribute them. It was in case of reverse engineering tags, under comparing different files. Um, so literally this one guy, um, I think there were 10 different settings on the screen, and he, or maybe five, and he, he, he made every single combination of settings. And so I could compare each one and see how it changed. So you could see there were differences with VC5. Aligned coefficient layouts is probably one of the big ones. Um, it was a good also sort of theoretical understanding. You could see how uh, the Cineform people managed to get like HD working in 2002. It's really, really simple and really, really designed to be fast. And after some more effort, um, well, there's more details in a link, you get to a working decoder. But we also discovered that some samples had some much more complicated structures, uh, 3D transforms, uh, interlaced, and Bayer. And so this was documented there. I should uh, use a tiny URL. And it did make an impact at GoPro, and I've, I've spoken to them about it in person, um, to the point that the management actually open sourced this as a direct result of my work. And so um, they published this, I think, six months a year ago. I'm not sure the exact date, but they published the entire SDK. So it was really interesting to see what actually lies beneath. And it was, broadly speaking, what I imagined it to be like. So super heavily optimized code, um, probably beyond what would be accepted in FMPEG. The few missing pieces I meant to, uh, talked about were implemented by a summer student this year. Uh, he has not integrated them into mainline yet, but I could probably do that. I guess Christmas is in a few weeks. Um, <laughs> it's not that big a piece of work, I suppose. Um, yeah, I suspect like some of you, 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 you go to suburbia and there's nothing to do over Christmas. But uh, that's, that's basically my Christmas is go to suburbia, there's nothing there. So, yeah. <laughs> so let's think about like, a bit more about this. What about the physical media some of these files come from? Um, one day someone's going to come across this physical media and wonder how to read these things. And the two in particular that I were looking at were Panasonic P2 and Sony S by S cards. And uh, those are PCI and PCI Express based, uh, respectively. So essentially, the precursors to um, modern storage that you have on your phone, maybe 10, 15 years old now. So high speed storage based around PCI. So you get these in high end servers. But I think the latest iPhone has a P uh, NVMe as well now. So this stuff was at the high end. Nowadays, it's commodity, but at the high end 10, 15 years ago, this is where it all started. Um, they've all got closed source drivers on a Mac or Windows. Um, I suspect the Windows ones in particular, Windows and Mac drivers in particular, at some point, they'll give up maintaining them. So I suspect they won't work in 100 years. Um, going back to the same argument to the FAMPEG, uh, Linux again, widespread. There's nothing really that supports the same wide range of hardware natively in an operating system as Linux. There's nothing comparable, so you can argue that that, and it's in billions of different devices, So you, like FFmpeg, so you could argue that that's a way of preserving uh, hardware features. So to look at Panasonic P2, um, it's PCMCI based, so like 1990s and 2000s laptops had one of these slots. Um, but PCI, the modern PCI Express is backwards compatible with legacy PCI. Um, 
I guess because of military and other legacy things, uh, the, the PC industry goes to painful lengths to make things backward compatible. It's worth saying there are also uh, other industries that use uh, form factors like this for storage. I believe dental records or something like that use this kind of card. Um, thankfully, there's eBay to buy cards like this where you can buy them. Um, so I thought um, one thing that sort of brought my attention to the fact was um, cameras are running Linux, and you can request the source code for these cameras. So I, I wrote to Panasonic and said, uh, can I have the source code for this whatever camera that could read these cards? And I got uh, tens of thousands of lines of code, maybe hundreds of thousands of lines. And digging in, I actually found this driver from uh, Linux 2.4. And so for those of you who aren't aware, Linux 2.4 is from about 2001. Um, so what do you do? Um, and what I actually did was uh, go to my parents' house, find my computer from high school that has one of these PCI slots, and uh, found an adapter, and wondered, like, would it actually work without the official, well, actually the official camera body? Like, could you actually plug it into a PC? Um, and after installing some very historical Linux distributions, a CentOS 2, I think it might have been, and a lot of effort, it actually worked to my surprise. Um, and that's what was off the card. I'd never had a way of reading it. It was some factory or something. Um, I've not actually pushed this any further. It's at least beyond my skill set to port a driver from 2.4 to 2 uh, to 4. Point whatever they're on now. There might be cam more cameras with a more reasonable driver, but I don't know if they have a reason to uh, ever update Linux on these cameras. I know t I know embedded devices have ancient drivers, um, but the but there it is. Um, I don't think it will be easily upstreamable, but someone could do it if they want to read these memory cards. Um, but at least in the future, there is an understanding of how the card is read, read and how one can read and write to the card. So Sony, uh, I tried the same with Sony. Unfortunately, there was no driver to be found, and there's some sort of hints that there was. Uh, so instead, looked into actually reverse engineering what the hardware is doing. Um, so I built this little rig here uh, to read the card. Um, um, and the driver at the time, I think, was Windows XP based. Um, what, one thing that's quite interesting is to try and use at least the, as old an OS as possible. You, theoretically, the older OSs would do things in a simpler fashion. Um, so what it do is you run Windows XP in a virtual machine, and you can, using so, using uh, techniques, you can actually sniff what the Windows is, Windows driver in a virtual machine is doing between the guest, or between the hardware and the guest and the and the host, so you can actually see what's going on. Uh, that's a much newer tutorial from what existed at the time, but there are ways of doing it. People do this to reverse engineer graphics card drivers and stuff. At the time, this wasn't actually that easy. I think it was like five years ago now. Um, you needed a CPU with an IOMMU, so um, this was quite difficult to find at the time. But I found, I think, one machine um, with the correct uh, memory mapping system to do that. Um, and it was pretty well known that um, these memory cards are block-based devices, so they store data in, in terms of blocks. And thankfully, I, on Windows, I uh, was kind of lucky that um, I could watch how the device was initialized, reproduce how the device was initialized, and I could use DD to like read each block at a time and say, and actually see what was happening. So I could read block zero and block one and block 100 and see what's actually going. And actually, it was relatively simple once you figured the patterns out. Uh, at least compared to modern architectures. So you say, I want block 100, and it just writes the thing saying, I want 100, and so you put it in this piece of memory, and then it gives you an interrupt. Or you, you write to some register, and it gives you an interrupt back. Um, so the code is there. It actually can read, and I think writing isn't too much work after that. Uh, I never got around to implementing DMA for high performance access, so it is a bit slow. I would like to tidy it up again and get it into mainline. Again, another thing maybe for Christmas. Quite a big piece of work, though. But um, yeah, I, I th think DMA might be possible now. I, I wasn't that familiar with Linux at the time, but I am a bit more familiar with how to do DMA on Linux. Um, I basically didn't want to implement writes because I didn't want to trash the card. I wanted to actually get it to work first. Um, so to conclude, um, audio video codec reverse engineering is really tending to completion. So the rate at which, because of, and arguably that's because of the complexity of, now, of modern codecs, the rate at which they're being developed is actually much, slow, much slower compared to the rate they're being reverse engineered. So there's actually going to come a tipping point where, well, there already is, I think we're already beyond the tipping point. We're actually going to come to the point where it tends to infinity and actually we reach, reach the stage where 
all Codex is supported, except for maybe some of the things Derek's going to talk about in a minute. But um, mm -hmm. this is really like remarkable for historical reasons. It's like people can actually have full control over the media that they produce. Um, as end users, they can actually quote unquote archive their content on sites like YouTube that instead of actually having something that came from a device and having to play it on that player, they can share it with the world without significant complexity in, in confirming it. Or that um, such file formats could be stored. I don't know what I think the phrase you guys use is born digital, but um, born compressed, um, where these files could be stored directly and be playable for decades, um, be playable theoretically forever. Um, and, with, and with the sort of swathes of media content that we have out from devices, that's possible. But there's still challenges with proprietary storage formats. Sony, in particular, um, famously are obsessed with making some minor variation of um, some format and then coming up with another one this week, uh, famously Blu-ray, mini-disc. Um, there are others. Um, and these, the, and so, some of the readers out there, I didn't really talk about it, but some of the readers out there are hardware-based. And at some point, that hardware won't disappear. But they're just wrapping a standardized interface like PCI Express or SD card and then exposing it as USB. But at some point, that won't work. So it's really important that you will be able to use commodity products, again, for, for, that are part of larger industries to read these kind of memory cards. And that's basically it. I guess this is going to be a very busy Christmas. Yeah, well. Um, any questions? Anyone ever knocked on your door and ask you uncomfortable questions about the work you're doing in terms of like, no. we're not happy that you do this? No, but other people in the community, yes. But I won't name them. <laughs> I think that's fair to say, yeah. <laughs> yes, the, yeah, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, it's the exception, not the rule. Uh, the, the response from GoPro was really surprising, actually. Um, that was a bit unexpected. But, yeah. Hi. Um, so, um, just based on what you were saying there, that it, it is looking like so many um, codecs will be covered by FFmpeg. Um, in uh, digital cinema now, um, the actual video and audio files are perfectly decodable by FFmpeg, but as um, they're, they're part of a larger package, you know, with composition playlists, and it's, there seems to be a trend with broadcast now as well with IMF. Um, so I'm wondering, do you think it could ever be part of um, FFmpeg's goals to kind of treat these, be able to read packages as opposed to individual files? Uh, personally, I think there are, peop there are people who want to, it to do that, but personally, I think it should be done at a higher layer. Um, FFmpeg could probably read the individual files, but the in interpretation of the package as a whole, as you say, isn't something that can be done on a, a, an individual basis. Uh, there's something there that needs to understand the sum of the parts and not just the parts itself.